All right, let's get started here. Um, so my name is uh, Rohit Agarwala. I'm a senior technical leader in the cloud platform and services group at Cisco. Um, the topic uh, that we're going to discuss here is about container networking. Um, so quick show of hands, how many folks have deployed containers either on laptop or on servers or have something running with containers in their environment? OK. And how many are network admins or network architects and lead networking for their data centers? OK. Um, any of you attended Contev session throughout the week? Contev, just one. So good. OK. Um, for you, there would be a little bit of an overlap. But for the rest, uh, we're going to actually see uh, what Contev is, which is a project that uh, Cisco started in the container networking space. And we'll do a live demo of that as well. Um, so this is what we have in the agenda in the next 45 minutes. We'll quickly touch upon the cloud native landscape and the ecosystem. How is the entire, you know, from a container and a microservices point of view, how is that evolving? Um, then we'll touch upon the container networking abstractions. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, you know, the Docker and the Kubernetes and the OpenShifts, these have a specific interface through which they program the infrastructure. So we'll talk about what that model is and how, how that's all coming into place in terms of the container platform itself and how that integrates with the infrastructure. So we'll talk about in the, that in the networking abstractions. Then we'll touch upon the data plane implementation details of some of the common and the standard networking within like Docker as well as in Kubernetes. Like what are the fundamental networking requirements uh, in these orchestration systems? And then look at like how some of the default reference implementations work as well. Um, then we'll touch upon Contiv. That is uh, you know, an open source project that is Cisco is leading that in the open source community. So we'll talk about that project and how that works with ACI. Um, how many folks have ACI deployed in their environment? Just one. OK. Well, this will give you an idea of why ACI is useful uh, with containers. And maybe that will be a good reason for you to look at ACI for your deployments as well. But again, with Contiv, it's not necessary that you need ACI. And, and we'll touch upon that during the presentation. So the cloud native landscape. Right? We, so many players. It's, it's just too, the ecosystem has exploded over the years. And you know, it's complex, right from the infrastructure point of view up until the application development. I mean, you probably cannot at the back see every icon in this. But there's just way too many things going on in the cloud native landscape. Uh, if you look at the infrastructure layer itself, you've got VMware, you've got OpenStack, you've got on bare metal, you've got public clouds with Azure and AWS. And then you have multiple runtimes. You've got you know, Docker runtime, CoreOS runtime, multiple orchestration engines with, with Kubernetes and OpenShift. And then if you look at the networking, which is just a small block here in the middle, there are about 10 players already in that market as well. And as an IT admin or as a developer, it's hard for you to actually try and understand what technologies you need to pick in your environment in order to build this entire stack. Containers have become so popular because Docker simplified some of it. But there are so many other things around this now that you need, from a technology implementation point of view, pick and choose the right ones. And specifically from a networking perspective, you need to understand the application requirements and make sure that your container platform is meeting those requirements. And, and, and specifically, if we double click on the container networking requirements, it's typically two things. One is that I want to provide container connectivity between my pods or my containers. And then I want some sort of policy or security in order to ensure that what can really communicate with each other in terms of containers. And then what are the other components within the data center to which my container can talk to. right? So connectivity and then policy. So these are the kind of the two main things that you need in a container networking implementation. And in this bucket, as you can see, a bunch of players. Um, you know, this is a zoomed in view. Some implementations can achieve the connectivity part of it, while some can achieve the policy part of it against a specific backend. But there are very few players that can actually do both connectivity as well as policy. And that's where Contiv, which is one of the implementations uh, we'll talk about later, you'll get to see how, that, how Contiv is enabling both of the things. 
But if we look at some of the other players, for example, uh, if we look at Flannel, Flannel is the default reference implementation in, for overlays that is part of Kubernetes. And we'll touch upon the implementation as well uh, as, as we go forward in, in the session. Uh, you got uh, Calico. Uh, Calico just does L3 implementation for containers. So it uses, like for example, BGP to distribute the inf router information. And we'll see that implementation as well in, in going forward as to what is really happening on the host from an L3 implementation. But again, the point here is that our requirements is that we, in addition to providing connectivity for my containers, I also want to provide a policy model so that I can define at a very granular level what are the things that can talk to each other. So today, there are only very few players, like I said, and Contev is one of them that can achieve it. So what are some of the challenges in the container networking world? For that, let's, let's look at a background as to where we started with. Previously, we just had the physical network with bare metal servers, and we were able to connect them to a switch. And you know, networking just worked right out of the box. You configured your VLANs. You know, if you had an SDN, it configured the VLANs on that switch, and it worked great. Then came you know, the age of virtualization, and then you know, OpenStax and the VMware. And then you were able to now deploy VMs within each of these bare metal hosts. What that led to was the creation of this vSwitch, right? And in this case, is the hypervisor switch or the virtual networking switch, and the advent of VXLAN or GRE or overlays from the host itself. Right? So it added a layer of encapsulation before your traffic actually hit the physical wire. Now with containers, there's another layer that is coming in, because now containers can be deployed within VMs, or it can be deployed directly on a, on a bare metal host. But if you deploy these containers on the VMs themselves, you now need another switch for the container networking as well, which is this switch for us. So now you can see there are two layers of switches on the host itself before your container traffic is actually hitting the physical wire. So imagine if you're doing VXLAN for your VMs, and you choose to do VXLAN for your containers as well, which are getting deployed within the VMs. Now you've got two layers of end cap for the traffic that's hitting the physical wire. That's, that's not acceptable, right? So, so in, in the networking world with containers, you have to be careful in terms of what is the data path implementation that you choose in order to achieve the right performance. And as we see, in addition to providing the right connectivity model from a data plane implementation, you want to be able to control what it can access and what it can talk to, just not other containers, but other parts of the data center as well. And that's where the policy model comes into the picture. So with, with these requirements, or these are the challenges, let's talk about how are the container orchestration engines thinking about implementing this within their environment. And specifically, the container orchestration engines that we are talking about is like Docker and, and Kubernetes and OpenShifts, so kind of the two main popular uh, uh, orchestration schedulers that are there in the market. So the first model is the container network model. Um, how many guys are familiar with OpenStack Neutron, the networking service? OK, about you know, 30 40% of the folks. So OpenStack Neutron has, has had a, you know, a logical model of defining how a topology looks like. And similarly, what Docker community did was they came up with a logical model of how a container network should be described. So they, they called it the container network model. And the main three constructs that exist in a container network model is a network sandbox, endpoint, and a network itself. So if we double click on what these mean, so a network is basically a collection of endpoints that can talk to each other. So imagine it to be a VLAN segment on an overlay segment. So your containers are your endpoints. If they're connected to a network, they will be able to talk to each other. So that's my logical definition. An endpoint is the interface itself. And the sandbox is the container networking namespace in which you are doing all the configuration for that container networking. So on a physical host, on a Linux host, if we map these constructs, uh, a, network, uh, a network sandbox will implement a namespace. Folks familiar with namespaces, VRFs? VRFs are on switches, namespaces are on Linux hosts. 
So that, that's what network sandbox maps into is a namespace within the physical host. An endpoint is a container that gets spun up, which is attached to that network namespace. So all the networking for that particular container is contained within that network sandbox or namespace. And a network is the rules, the connectivity rules that are you are defining for that network endpoint. So whether it use, needs to use VLAN 100 or it needs to have a VXLAN end cap, whatever that ID is, all of those rules are getting programmed by the network definition. So this is the model that is basically proposed by Docker. And as you can see, I can create multiple networks. And then I can spin up my containers by attaching those to the specific network itself. So containers that are on two different networks, they will not be able to talk to each other. Now, all of this is the reference implementation is based on the host. Uh, and we'll look at what are the different data plane implementations that come right out of the box in the next section, where we see what are the d default CNM drivers and what are the remote drivers that exist. But keep, in, keep this in mind as the model that Docker Swarm or the Docker data center uh, uses for implementing networking. The second model that we have is the container network interface model. Uh, so this is the model that was proposed by CoreOS, uh, and it is very popular in the Kubernetes community. Actually, this is the model that is used in the Kubernetes community. And there were a couple of reasons why the Kubernetes community did not actually adopt the Docker CNM model for networking. The first reason is that in, in case of Kubernetes, the smallest unit of deployment is a pod. It's not a container. So a difference between a pod in a container is that a pod can consist of multiple containers within it. And that's how the Kubernetes community came up that there is a concept of pod in which you will deploy containers that are very tightly coupled to each other. And that's the smallest unit of deployment. So that was the first major difference. The second major difference between the models was that Kubernetes fundamentally had different networking requirements. And we'll go over those. But those requirements meant like, that each of the pod needs to have a routable IP address. That I need to be able to talk to my pod without any NAT. These were completely different from the Docker's reference implementation of the CNM model, which had NATing, which had you know, private addresses, which were not routable. All of those things were in the CNM model. So because of these two reasons, the Kubernetes community kind of adopted and went with the CNI model. So what does the CNI model include? So it includes only two constructs, that I should be able to connect my pod into a network, and I should be able to remove a pod from a network. That's it. You specify that specification in a JSON config file. And when your pod is coming up, it references that config file in order to plug the container into the namespace that is relevant on that host. Again, very pluggable implementation, so you can have multiple CNI drivers. And as we go progress further, we'll see what is the default reference implementation for some of these drivers. So now let's double click on the data plane implementation. So what we have talked about is that the CNM model exists in the Docker environment, and the CNI model exists in the Kubernetes environment. And there are then reference implementations for the CNM as well, as well as for CNI. And we'll now look at how actually is what's happening on the host itself with the reference implementations for CNM as well as for CNI. So this is from the CNM, again, Docker networking specifically. So there are a bunch of drivers that I've listed here. And these are available to you right out of the box. So in case if you spin up a Docker on your laptop, for example, you can pretty much use any of these drivers. So starting with the bridge network driver. So this is the default driver that exists in Docker. Um, and we'll see in the next picture, actually, what that means. We have the none driver in which you are saying that I don't want actual any network connectivity for my containers that are spinning up. And you may do that for reasons that I'm not aware. Like if you don't have network connectivity to a container, why would you spin up a container? But again, for just deploying an application, they may be useful. Then you have the host network driver. This is the driver that says, hey, container, don't use your network namespace, but use the host networking stack itself for forwarding the packets. So remember, we talked about a network namespace that is getting created for every container. 
which has all the configurations for that containers networking. Well, if you use the host network driver, you're telling that don't create that container network namespace. I want to use the host forwarding stack to forward all of my container traffic. The fourth one is the overlay network driver. So till now, all the three drivers that we talked about are for a single host only. In case if you have multiple hosts, which of course you would in a, in a production environment, you want to be able to use a driver that provides connectivity across containers deployed on multiple hosts. So that's where the overlay driver comes into picture. So Docker comes up with a VXLAN overlay driver by default that you can use. Uh, but it doesn't use any of the new capabilities that we have from a protocol perspective like eVPN in order to distribute the route information for the VXLAN fabric itself. We'll see in the next slide what exactly they use in order to distribute that information. Then we have the Mac VLAN driver. Again, this was a new driver which is an experimental mode in Docker. Uh, and the purpose of this driver is to actually not use any Linux bridges on the host, but use some of the advanced capabilities that are part of the Linux kernel itself to provide networking for the container itself. And we'll see in the in a picture how that's implemented. Uh, now we got the remote drivers. So imagine having ACI or imagine having uh, you know, other SDN controllers in your environment and you want to use that SDN controller to actually implement a lot more networking in your infrastructure when our containers are coming up. So in that case, you will be creating a remote driver so when a container is coming up, that container call goes through the CNM interface into your remote driver to actually program the infrastructure underneath for that container networking. So that's what Docker provides with the CNM model, the capability to integrate with your infrastructure through these remote drivers. Now, all of these drivers, the fundamental thing that they are doing is providing L2 connectivity. That is, you're saying that one container can talk to another container on that network. If you want to have L3 connectivity, for example, north-south or east-west routing, then it uses IP tables for that. So IP tables are rules, again, on the Linux host that are programmed by Docker so that it nats the traffic with the host IP address when it's trying to reach outside. So that gives you the capability to basically do the SNAT and as well as return traffic to do the DNAT. Any questions on this? Question. So the question is, uh, the IP table rules, are they part of the container or are they part of the host? So the IP table rules are on the host. The container traffic is hitting the IP table rules on the host and then getting forwarded outside to the world. So this is a pictorial representation of the, of the three different modes that we talked about. I mean, we talked about at least five modes, but I've captured here three ones. Uh, so the first one is the bridge networking. Here, Docker 0 is our Linux bridge. So any default reference implementation, you always get a Docker 0 bridge created. This is a Linux bridge. This is the bridge in which you will assign a subnet range to that bridge. And when your containers come up, the Docker bridge will give out an IP address from that subnet that is associated with the Linux bridge. So in this case, C1 and C2 are two different containers. They will have one interface, and it will be attached through a VETH pair, again, a Linux construct and it will get an IP address. And because the Linux bridge is acting as an L2 bridge, all your containers that are attached to that bridge will be able to talk to each other. Now you can create separate bridges for each of your networks, which means then you will have isolation that you know C3 and C4 are on a completely different Docker bridge. Again, this is useful in a single host mode only. So if you have multiple hosts, then you will need the overlay VXLAN driver. So in this case, I'm creating different bridges for my different networks, and they get encapsulated with the right appropriate VXLAN uh, overlay uh, tag, and it is sent to the right destination node, which has my destination container. Now, I touched upon that the route information in terms of where the packet needs to go, that information is not distributed using eVPN or not using multicast. In this case, Docker actually implements a gossip protocol this is a, a distributed systems protocol that it uses to actually distribute all of the networking information or the control plane information for the VXLAN network itself. The good thing is this is already built into the system. So you don't have to take care of the gossip or the underlying configuration of how that route information is working. But as a developer, 
or and as an application user, they can potentially deploy an overlay network without the network admin being in the picture. So that is something to keep in mind. And that's how most developers actually consume Docker today for a multi-host environment, that they just assume the physical infrastructure to be an L3 forwarding pipe, and they create VXLAN networks for their containers, which routes the traffic. Uh, the third model is the underlay networking, which is the Mac VLAN driver. Uh, so the Docker Zero bridge, these Docker bridges and the IP table rules, these are not great from a performance perspective because now you have additional layer of switching or IP table translation that goes through before the traffic is actually going out. So what Docker did was provide a much simpler implementation using some of the advanced Linux kernel capabilities, and which is the Mac VLAN driver. So what this does is that it carves out a sub interface or a Mac VLAN interface from the physical interface on the host. You probably guys are familiar with sub interfaces on our switches. So a similar capability exists on the Linux host where I'm carving out ETH0 with ETH0.10. So this is a specific Mac VLAN interface to which I can create and attach my containers that can come up. Now I don't have any bridge in between like the Docker Zero bridge for forwarding my traffic. I'm literally forwarding my traffic through my physical interface that's on the host because that's the back VLAN kernel capability that I'm using for my networking. Does this make sense? Any question? OK. Um, now let's move into the Kubernetes networking part. Now remember we talked about that the CNI model is the reference implementation with, with Kubernetes. Uh, question. So the question is, in case of Mac VLAN, where does the MAC addresses come from? So Docker takes care of that, providing the MAC addresses for the container itself. For the interface, this interface, it's you, the admin, who is providing the uh, MAC address for that physical interface on the host. Would I be able to recognize uh, uh, these containers in the network as a network admin? So the question is, will I be able to recognize these containers on the network? So. By, by whenever you are trying to reach from one endpoint to the other endpoint, and if you don't know where to route, you do an ARP, right? You request. And that's how you, your network will learn that I have an, a new endpoint with a particular MAC address and IP, and it will broadcast and wait for the response to come back. Because it's all going through that particular physical interface that's on the host. All right. So. Um, now we have the Kubernetes networking. So we talked about, you know, there were fundamental differences from a model perspective because of which the CNI or the container network interface was used in the Kubernetes environment. And these are kind of the three fundamental that I captured. The first one being that all containers can communicate with each other without NAT. Remember in the Docker model, we had the IP table rules, which is used for all the L3 traffic. Well, in Kubernetes case, they say, well, we don't like any NATing. What that means is that your pods within Kubernetes need to have a routable IP address, or your fabric itself should be capable of routing the container traffic, which could be a good thing, right? Because you don't want to use host IP table rules for doing NATing and forwarding your traffic. The second point is all nodes can communicate with all containers without NAT. So the pods themselves will run on a host, right, at the end of the day. And you will have use cases where the pods will try to talk to the host itself. That host could be a VM. That host could be a bare metal node. Again, the requirement here is that all of that implementation should be part of the cloud or should be part of the data center and not part of the orchestration system. So that's why the Kubernetes model is so strong from a networking point of view, because it gives the admin the control over defining how should the connectivity happen rather than relying on the host to do all of these natting functionality. And the last point is from an external world, that you should be able to, again, reach the pods directly without any of the NAT. So if you look at the implementations, the way this is done, actually, let's go into the pictorial representation, and this will give a good idea. So the first one is the pod implementation that, remember I talked about that the smallest unit of deployment is a pod in Kubernetes. And a pod can consist of multiple containers. So how does networking work in that case? So here you can see C1 and C2 are two containers within a pod, but they share a common network namespace. And that common network namespace gets an IP address assigned. 
So Kubernetes then takes care of making sure that it is forwarding the packet to the appropriate container when the packet is hitting that container, uh, hitting the pod's IP address. Because each of these containers will have separate ports exposed against the shared IP against which you are trying to make that request. Now, from a pod to pod and pod to node perspective, remember we talked about some of the fundamental requirements where each of the pods will have their own IP address and then each of the nodes themselves will have their IP address so that the pods and the nodes can talk to each other. You create a bridge in this case, which is handing out the pods IP address, just like in Docker's case. But the routing functionality of communicating between the two containers or two pods is all taken care of by your fabric itself. You do have constructs like service IP within Kubernetes, which can front end all of your pods. But that is, again, the implementation, the routing functionality for that is relying on the rest of the data center or the cloud to actually do that for you. Kubernetes does not, by default, uh, provides any capability to provide the connectivity. In fact, it assumes that all of these things are connected on a single network. So if we look at the, some of the reference implementations today that exist, uh, you know, we talked about the Docker implementation with the Mac VLAN drivers and the overlay drivers. Uh, with Kubernetes, these are the couple of reference implementations that, that, that you can achieve uh, for your connectivity. The first one being Flannel. Um, Flannel provides overlay connectivity for your containers or for your pods in a Kubernetes environment. And as you can see here, you know, when we encapsulate the packet, it basically encapsulates it with the destination, with the source of the host and the destination of the node on which the de destination pod is running. Um, and again, it distributes all of that information using the uh, flannel agents which are running on the host themselves. There is another mode that exists, which is the host gateway mode. Um, in this mode, you are using the host uh, L3 functionality to actually uh, route the traffic into the, into the pod or the destination pod. This is a pure L3 mode. It's not a VXLAN mode. But again, there is no policy in this model. It's only providing you with connectivity for your containers. Remember, one of the challenges that we talked about was that in addition to connectivity, you want to also provide policy. So in case of Flannel, you only have the connectivity option using the VXLAN overlay or using the host gateway mode. In case of Calico, it's only providing you with L3 connectivity. So it it's fundamentally is using a BGP or a bird agent that's running on the host to distribute the route information for your uh, pods that are coming up in your environment. So you require that your physical infrastructure is configured with BGP in order to exchange your destination routing. Calico does have a policy model, but again, from a back-end implementation point of view, it's, it can only be applied to an L3 implementation, and you have an overhead of implementing BGP in your environment. So now let's look at Contiv. Um, so till now, we have talked about the CNM, CNI model, what are the reference implementations with CNM, and we talked about the CNI implementations with Kubernetes, with Flannel and Calico. With Contiv, you can achieve the connectivity as well as the policy. So Contiv is a 100% open source project started by Cisco. Um, there are two main things that come along with Contiv. One is that it can provide you with various networking backend implementations for your containers. So whether it be an L2 implementation with VLANs, or it be a VXLAN implementation, or L3 BGP, or with ACI, you can use a single Contiv framework to achieve any of these backend implementations. From a policy perspective, we provide a nice policy model to define what are the different endpoint groups that should exist within the network itself, and what are the policies that are going to be associated with each of these networks that are tied to the endpoint groups. And we'll see that in actually in a live demo. Again, the advantage here that comes is that this rich policy model can be applied against any of these backends. So whether you have ACI or you have just an L2 network connectivity for your containers, you can use Contev's policy model along with that. So that is kind of what's captured uh, in the three corners of the triangle here. Um, first is we provide any networking. Second is any infrastructure. So whether you are running this on VMs that are deployed in OpenStack or VMs in VMware or even on bare metal server or a public cloud provider such as AWS, Contev will work right out of the box. 
Of course, there are certain networking backend implementations that you will pick, such as an AWS, a VXLAN makes sense. But in case of a bare metal, you can use any like, bare, uh, like VLAN or VXLAN or ACI. Any platform, so whether you are using Docker Swarm, your, your, your guys are using Docker Swarm or using Kubernetes or using OpenShift from Red Hat, uh, Contev has that integration. You know, the main reason for that is because these follow either the CNM model or follow the CNI model, and we have created a Contev driver for both CNM as well as for CNI. So you can leverage Contev against these different backends. From a policy point of view, there are two main things to keep in mind. One is from an IT admin perspective, what you care about. And second is from a developer's or a DevOps perspective. From an IT admin perspective, you care about reusing or using the infrastructure capabilities into your container platform. And that's where we have the tight integration with ACI in order to provide the connectivity and the forwarding into the fabric itself. And then also implement all of the context policy model directly into the fabric. So all of your container forwarding as well as container connectivity is governed by APIC by programming the fabric appropriately. Second is connectivity across containers, VMs, and bare metal. So we realize that not everything is going to be containers tomorrow. There is going to be a hybrid deployment with containers, VMs, and bare metal. So how do you make sure that these different resources can still communicate with each other for your application? And we can enable that with Contiv. And the last part here is the LDAP and RBAC integration. So you can have an active directory, and you can enable only certain developers to consume the policies that you as an admin are defining for your deployment. So you can define these policies, and your developers, based on their roles, can consume only specific set of things in order to connect within your data center. From a workflow perspective, nothing changes for your developers. Whether they are using ACI or they are using VLAN mode for container connectivity, they, their application template doesn't change at all. They continue to interact with their infrastructure in a similar way without actually knowing that whether it's ACI or it's, a, it's a, or any of the other backend implementation. So we just are introducing the 1.0 beta at this conference. And some of the advanced capabilities, such as the, advanced, uh, such as the LDAP integration, the UI, the integration with OpenShift, and the simple one-click install, these are all new features that have come into Contiv. Uh, and we have worked over the past few months in order to include that as part of our 1.0 beta release. Um, from a support perspective, we already have customers in running in production. In fact, one of our customers here is at this conference, SAP Ariba, that have talked about their use case of how they're deploying Contiv with ACI and running it in production. Uh, we have or will be announcing very shortly both technical services as well as advanced services support. So in case if this is of interest to you and you deploy this in your production and you need support, you can call Cisco to provide you support in your production environment. So this is a summary of the, of the ACI integration. And then we'll look at the demo of how Contiv works with ACI. What we'll basically see is that using Kubernetes, I'll be able to bring up pods. And I'll do that by defining a pod spec and reference the tenants or the networks and the policies that I have created using Contiv. And that will allow me to provide both network isolation as well manage the connectivity for my pods uh, across different parts of the application itself. From a workflow perspective, when a pod comes up, it talks to Contiv Master, which is our basically brain of the entire system that communicates with APIC in order to program the fabric. We have Open vSwitch that's running within the container host that we program. That's the responsibility of the Contiv plugin to program it both from the connectivity perspective as well as from a policy perspective as to how the uh, packet should be routed, how the packet should be forwarded uh, within the data center. Um, again, like I had mentioned, we, we provide integration against different infrastructures. So whether the container host is a VM or it's a bare metal server. Uh, Contiv will work, and we have validated against all of these different types of deployment. So this is my demo topology. I have got a few VMs that are running in the ESXi environment. Uh, this is the VM that I'm going to actually try to communicate with my pods that are running within a virtual machine. Um, I'll be using ACI Fabric to actually expose some of the external contracts from the VM itself that my pod, such as my DB, is going to consume 
and then connect based on the policy model that I have defined. So we will see that how only the DB layer is able to, or the DB pod is able to talk to my legacy VM, and my app is not able to talk to my legacy VM because I have defined my contract in a way, in such a way. Similarly, we'll see that when I bring these pods up, my app and DB are not able to talk to each other, but when I create the appropriate policies, they are able to talk to each other. Any questions on this before I switch into my demo terminal? OK. So this is uh, my host on which I'm running my NetMaster or my Kubernetes master. So what we are going to do is basically run a script. And we'll also then go back and actually um, uh, look at some of the things that, are, that the script is programming. Before I do that, let me actually show you a couple of things. Um, first, I will go into my Contev dashboard. So this is the CLI that I was talking about. So I'm going to log in here using admin credentials. Um, and see there are basically no networks or application groups or profiles or network policies created right now. If I go into my APIC, uh, if I remember my password, uh, ah, OK, INS, mm -hmm. um, we'll let this come up. We'll be able to see there is no specific networks or definitions that are existing in APIC specific to my container network. Um, will this give, give this another second to come up? Uh, let's start the script here so that we can start seeing what's there. Some of the initial commands will be just information about what I am running. So here you can see I have run a command to see what are the different nodes that I am running. This is the Kubernetes environment. So I have a master running, and then I have two worker nodes running. Then I do a netcurtl command. This is my contiv CLI. So this is the CLI that I'm using to set what is the forwarding mode that I need to be using for my container environment. And I'm specifying a set of VLANs here that I need to be using. So I have configured these VLANs previously within my APIC. So when I tag my container traffic with one of these VLANs, my APIC will understand what to do with them and forward it appropriately. So that's what I'm doing here. Let's go ahead and press yes. I have pre I've created a few tenants. I have a compute tenant that I'm going to be using in order to provide the connectivity against all of the pods that I spin up. So here I'm creating an external contract. And uh, this is the contract that is being exposed by my virtual machine. So um, let's go back into our APIC and actually see this exist. So if I go into my tenants here, and look at the compute tenant, um, we'll see a bunch of things. And we'll be able to see the external contract that I just created within Contiv. Um, this should be, so we can see here within the application profiles, I have the external VM profile created. So if I click on this, um, we'll, we'll see that come up here, that I have this VM, which is my endpoint group in my APIC environment because that's the VM attached to ACI. And I've created a contract or a policy against which I'm saying that ICMP traffic needs to be allowed. This is what I basically referenced here when I created an external contract for that particular VM. right? And this is what I'm going to be using for my pods. So let's press yes here again. Uh, next, what I'm do doing is I'm sp showing what networks exist. And I've created a network as well. So here I've created a network for my tenant compute. I specified the encapsulation type to be VLAN, because my ACI is going to do all the forwarding and VXLAN and NCAP. I have specified the subnet. I have specified the gateway. So in case if I need L3 connectivity, the gateway is where all my traffic is going to go to, and which is, again, existing within my ACI fabric. And then and I have named this to be PodNet, right? So let's press yes here. Um, now what I've done is I've created a couple of groups. My first group is an app group. My second group is a DB group. In my app group, I have referenced the external contracts that I just mentioned about. So what this means is that my app is referencing and should be able to talk to the legacy VM. Versus in my DB group, I'm not specifying or using the external contract that I just created. So I should not be able to talk to that 
the, uh, to the external VM using my DB pod. So let's go ahead and press yes. Now what I'm doing is I'm creating the final entity called the app profile, which brings in the app and the DB endpoint groups, which is captured here, and pushes that into my ACI as a compute profile. So if I go back into my APIC, I can see now a compute profile has popped up. I can see my EPGs that have been created. And if I click on my application EPGs, um, I'll be able to see my app. Let's click on compute EPG. I can see now the graph based on the connectivity model that I have created, right? So these are my app and DB endpoint groups. My app is referencing the external contract, which is being uh, provided by the, ex by the external legacy VM. So in this model, again, app will be able to talk and ping my VM, but DB will not be able to ping the VM. App will not be able to ping the DB because I don't have any definitions or any policies to provide that. If I go into my, uh, uh, my Contiv UI, I can see now you know, I've created a pod net. Um, I've got the two application groups created or endpoints group created. I push the application profile, which has the app and the DB. There are no network policies right now for those DBs, but I have external contracts defined, which I've captured here as well. If I go into my settings and look at my network defaults, I can see a bunch of things that I had specified using my script are also showed that I'm using ACI as my forwarding mode. These are the VLANs that I need to use. So as you can see, you can do all of these things through the UI, but I did those in through the script just to show quickly how the UI can consume that information as well. So let's continue here. So I'm going to say yes. Um, we, we saw the app profile got created. Um, now what I've done is I have now, as a developer, spun up a few pods in my Kubernetes environment. So this is the critical path that you as an admin have done all the important task of creating the app profiles, the endpoint groups, and everything that you need. Now your developers are going to be referencing the things that you have created. So in this example, you can see I've created a app one, and in this I've specified a bunch of labels. And if you remember, these are the things that I created using Contiv. So I am specifying that it needs to be for a compute tenant, it needs to be on the podnet network, and it needs to be part of the app endpoint group. So anything that I have created and attached to the endpoint group for app, it will be consumed by that pod. So remember our external contract being associated with the app endpoint group? That is now in action. Similarly for my DB, if you see I've created my DB, but it's simple, it doesn't have any of the endpoint groups or the external contracts. Um, now here you can see I did a Cube cuddle command to run all the pods that are running. These are the IP addresses for each of the guy, each of the pods that have come up. Let's log into one of these pods. I'm going to copy one of the commands here. And uh, let's log back into our machine here and run the command to get into the pod. So I'm now into my pod. If I do an IPA, I can see it's got an IP address that Contiv gave to that pod, right? So if I now try to ping uh, my dot two, this is my same app two, which is in the same endpoint group. So I'm able to ping because they are the same within the same endpoint group. But if I try to ping dot three, which is basically my DB, that was my third, uh, third pod that I had created, I'm not able to do because I have not defined the policy between the app and the DB. So everything, everything that's in between is getting blocked. Now if I try to ping the external VM from this guy, so if I do 101.101.101, .101 I'm able to ping my external VM. So this is the IP address that my, that my VM, was, uh, VM had and I had attached with the external contract. If I actually go into my DB layer here, and try to do the same ping to my external VM, I cannot, right? So I'm controlling at a very granular level the components of my application itself, how they talk to each other, providing them with connectivity options, and then also using ACI, enabling how 
my containers can talk to other external systems that exist within my data center. You're relying on ACI to do the forwarding for you, as well as control the programmability from a policy point of view, how that gets implemented. So these are the four use cases we went through, basically. We, we made sure that app can talk to app two. App one can talk to app two, because they are part of the same endpoint group. Uh, we made sure that app one cannot ping my DB one, because they are part of different endpoint groups. We made sure that app one can consume the external contract and talk to my legacy VM. And then my DB, which is not associated with my external contract, cannot talk to the legacy VM. Uh, the last point here is that I am adding another group or another policy which says that I now want my app to be able to talk to my DB. So this is, again, taking another step in terms of making sure that even at that application or the pod container level, I can further update my policies dynamically and program the fabric at the same time. So if I go back to my um, app one here and try to ping uh, my DB, I should be able to do now because I've just updated my policy. And there you go. From app to DB, we were not able to ping, but I updated my policy as a, dev as a user or as an administrator. And now I can ping uh, the different components that exist. So let me now just run a yes, and I, hopefully this will clean up everything. But that was kind of the demo, so I'll go back to my slides here and summarize our session and let you guys go have a party. Uh, so in summary, Contiv is a policy framework as well as a container networking implementation for different backends. It's an open source project that Cisco has started. It is available with different container orchestration engines, including Docker and Kubernetes. And it provides you a policy model that you can apply against different backends. But with ACI, you get additional advantage. So if you or anybody within your network team is thinking about ACI and containers, then you should absolutely pay attention to Contiv and how you can enable both your IT admin as well as your developers to work hand in hand and achieve the true connectivity and policy from a security point of view in your production environment. We are just releasing the beta code. So all of our releases are uh, in the GitHub. So you can check it out. We have updated our documentation at the following link. Uh, it's got a bunch of tutorials as well. So in case if you are interested in running Contiv on your laptop or in a VMware environment, you can quickly bring up Vagrant boxes uh, and get going. There were a couple of workshops. There was a four-hour tutorial as well on using Contiv with ACI. There's a lot of documentation available. I think it's on contiv.syscolive.com. There's a Slack channel as well. So in case if you are interested in participating in community conversations, and finding out from other users, you know, like even SAP Ariba, definitely check out, check out their video. Go, uh, come and join our community where you can listen and look at what others are asking and doing with Contiv. And then finally, there's a lot of blogs uh, that we are posting in terms of how, you know, uh, the demos that we're doing are going on the blogs. So in case if you just want to understand the functionality and learn more, you can use our blogs. So this is a summary of all the slide, all the sessions content related sessions that were at this event. Some of these are, have got recorded, such as the deep dive on Conti, which talks about the data plane implementation details. So de definitely encourage you to go back and look at that. Um, that's kind of my summary uh, and my last slide that, you know, it's DevNet is, not, is a great forum for you guys to come in, and especially on a Thursday evening, uh, to spend these 45 minutes with me. Appreciate your feedback in terms of how I did and what are the, some of the new things that you would like to see from a developer's perspective in the new sessions and in, in the future. Uh, so please complete the online evaluation. And uh, if there are any questions, otherwise, thank you.